Speedrunner, south into Lake Damon, into the land where greens are wide for dancing. Athena went to, to put in the mind of home, her great he hearted hero's honored son, rousing him to return. And there she found him with Nestor's lad in the late night of at rest, under the portico of Menelaus, the famous king, stilled by the power of slumber. The son of Nestor lay, but honey eyes sleep had not yet taken in her arms Telemachus. All through the starlit night, with open eyes, he pondered what he had about heard about his father, until the bus Bedside gray-eyed Athena towered and said, The brave thing now, Telemachus, would be to end this journey far from home. All that you own, you left behind with men, so lost to honor in your house, that they may devour it all, share you out among them. How will your journey save you then? Go quickly to the lord of the great cry, Menelaus. Press him to send you back. You may yet to find the queen, your mother, in her rooms alone. It seems her father and, the, and her kinsmen say your Macus is the man for her to marry. He has outdone the suitors, all the rest, and gifts to her, and made his pledges double. Check him, or he will have your lands and chattels in spite of you. You know a woman's pride at bringing riches to the man she marries, as to her girlhood husband, fair her first children. He is forgotten being dead, and they no longer worry her. So act alone. Go back and trust your riches to the servant, worthiest in all your eyes. Until the god have made known what beauty you shall call your, uh, you yourself shall marry. This too I have to tell you. Now take heed. The suitor's ringleaders are not hot for murder, waiting in the channel between Ithaca and Sami's rocky side. They mean to kill you before you can set foot ashore. I doubt they'll bring it off. Dark earth instead may take her Take her cold to may take oh my god may take to her cold bed after a few brave suitors who preyed upon your cattle. Bear well out in your good ship to eastward off the islands and to sail again by night. Someone immortal who cares for you will make a fair wind blow. Touch at the first beach, go ashore and send your ship and crew around to port by sea. While you go inland to the forester, your old friend, loyal keep swine, remain that night with him. Send him to town to tell your what watchful mother Penelope, that you're back from Pylos is safe and sound. With this, Athena left him for Olympos. He swung his foot across and gave a kick, and said to the son of Nestor, Open your eyes, Pisitros. Get your team to, into her harness. We have a long day's journey. Nestor's son turned over and answered him. It is... <coughs> It is still night. No moon. Can we drive now? We cannot itch as we may from the Roan home. Dawn is near. Allow the captain of Spearman, Menelaos, to time to pack our car with gifts and time to speak a gracious word, sending us off. A guest remembers all his days, that host who make provisions for him kindly. The dawn soon took her throne of gold, and Lord Menelaos, clarion in the battle, rose from where he lay beside the beauty of Helen with her shining hair. He strode into the hall nearby. Hearing him come, Odysseus' son pulled on his snowy tunic over the skin, gathered his long cape about his breadth of shoulder like a captain. The heir of King Odysseus, at the door he stood and said, Lord Marshal, Menelaus, send me home now to my dear country. Longing has come upon me to go home. The Lord of the Great War cry said at once, If you're longing to go home, Telemachus, I would not keep you for the world, not I. I think myself or any host as ill-mannered for over friendliness as for hostility. Measure is best in everything, to send a guest packing or cling to him when he's in haste. One sin equals the other. Good entertaining ends with no detaining. Only let me load your cars with gifts and fine ones, you shall see. I'll bid the women set out for breakfast from the lord larder stores, honor and appetite. We'll attend to both before a long day's journey over land. Or would you can't care to try the Argive Midlands and Hellas in my company? I'll harness my own team and take you through the towns. Guests like ourselves, no lord will turn away. Each one will make it one gift, at least, to carry home with us. Tripod or cauldron, wrought in bronze, mule team, or golden cup. Clear head to Telemachus replied, Lord Marshal Menelaus, royal son of Atreus, I must return to my own hearth. Hurt hearth. Here I left no one behind as guardian of my property. This is going abroad for news of my great father. Heaven forbid it be my own undoing, or any precious thing be lost at home. At this, the tall king clarion in battle called to his lady and her waiting women to give them breakfast from the larger stores. Atronius, the son of Beothus, 
Thus came straight from bed, where he lodged nearby, and Menelaus ordered a firelit for broiling mutton. The king's men obeyed. Then down to the cedar chamber, Menelaus walked with Helen and Prince Megapenthes. Amid the gold he had in that place, lying the son of Atreus, picked a wine cup, wrought with handles left and right, and told his son to take a silver wine bowl. Helen lingered near the deep coffers, filled with grounds, her own handiwork. Tall goddesses among men, women. She lifted out the robe of state so royal, adorned with brilliant with embroidery. Deep in the chest, it shimmered like a star. Now all three hundred turned back to the door to greet Telemachus, and right-haired Menelaus cried out to him, O oh, Prince Telemachus, my hair is lord of thunder. See you home and bring you to the welcome your desire. Here are your gifts, perfect and precious things. I wish to make your own out of my treasure. And gently the great... Captain, son of Atreus, handed him the goblet. Megapenthes carried out the wine bowl, glinting silvery, uh, to set before him, and the lady Helen drew near, so that he saw her cheeks pure lime. She held the gown and murmured, I too bring you a gift, dear child, and here it is. Remember Helen's hand by this. Keep it for your own bride, your joyful wedding day. Let your dear mother guard it in her chamber. My blessing, you may come down. Soon to your island, home to your timbered hall. So she bestowed it, and happily he took it. These fine things, Besitros, packed well in the wicker carrier. Admiring everyone, then Menelaus led the two guests to in to take their seats on thrones and easy chairs in the great hall. Now came a maid to tip a golden jug of water over a silver finger bowl. And draw the polished tables up beside them. And a larger, the larger mistress brought her trades of tray of loaves, with many savories to lavish on them. Viands were served by Etonius, and wine by Menelaus. Every hand reached out upon the good meat and drink to take them, driving away hunger and thirst. At last, Telemachus and Nestor's son soon led out their team to harness, mounted their bright car, and drove down under the echoing entranceway, while the red-haired Menelaus, Atreus's son, walked alongside with golden cup wine for the wayfarers to spill at parting. But then, by the tugging team, he stood and spoke over the horse's head. Farewell, my lads, homage to Nestor, the benevolent king. In my time, he was fatherly to me. When the flower of Achaea warred on Troy, Telemachus made his reply. No fear, but we shall bear at last, as far as Nestor, your message is, great king. How could I, how I could wish to bring them home to Ithaca? If only Odysseus were there, if he could hear me tell of all the courtesy I have had from you. Returning with your fiery and your treasure, even as he spoke, a beat of wings went skyward off to the right. A mountain eagle grap a grappling a white goose in his talons. Heavy prey hooked from a farmyard. Women and men at arms made a hubbub running as he flew over, but then he wheeled hard right before the horses a sight that made the whole crowd sheer with hearts lifting in joy. Pisistros called out, Read us the sign, O Menelaus, Lord Marshal of Armies. Was the god revealing something thus to you or to ourselves? At this, the old friend of the god of battle groped in his mind for the right thing to say, but Re Regal Helen put in quickly. Listen, I can tell you, tell you what the Amen means. As light is given me, and I see it point by point fulfilled, the beat the beaked eagle flew from the wild wind of his fathers to take prey of the tame house bird. Just so, Odysseus, back from his hard trials and wandering, will soon come down in fury on his house. He may be there today, and a black hour he brings upon the suitors. Telemachus gazed and said, May Zeus, the lord of Hera, make it so, and far off at the call of my life, I shall invoke you a goddess, lady. He let the wit fall, and the, resist the restive mares broke forward at a canter through the town into the open country. All that day, they kept their harness shaking side by side until at sundown, when the roads grew dim, they made a halt at Ferre. There, Diclo Diocles, son of Ortic oh my God, Ortilicus, who whom Alpheus fathered, woke up the young men, and they slept the night. Up when the young dawn's fingertips of rose opened in the east, they hitched the team once more to the painted car, and steered our wet sword through the echoing gates, whipping their fresh horses into a run. Approaching Pylos, height at that day's end, Telemachus appealed to the son of Nestor. Could you, I wonder, do a thing I will tell you, supposing you agree? <laughs> How stupid. We take ourselves to be true friends in age alike, and bound by ties between our fathers, and now partnership in his adventure. Prince, do not take me roundabout, but leave me at the 
the ship, else the old king your father will detain me overnight for love of guests, when I should be at sea. The son of Nestor nodded, thinking quite swiftly how best he could oblige his friend. Here was his choice, to pull the team hard over along the beach till he reigned then in beside the ship, unloading Menelaus's royal keepsakes into the stern sheets. He sang out, now for action, get aboard and call your men b before I break the news at home in hall to father. Who knows better the old man's heart than I? If you delay, he will not let you go, but I'll, he'll descend on you in person, imperious. No turning back with empty hands for him. Believe me, once his blood is up, he shook the reins to the lovely mares with long manses in the wind, guiding them full tilt toward his father's hall. Telemachus called in the crew and told them, get everything at ship shape aboard this craft. We pull him out now and put sea miles up behind us. The listening men obeyed him, climbing into the settle on the benches by the rowlocks while he stood there watching by the stern. He poured out offerings there and prayers to Athena. Now a strange man came up to him, an Easterner, fresh from smelling blood in distant Argos, a hunted man, gifted in prophecy. He had as forbore that Melipus, wizard who lived off old in Pylos, mother city of western flocks. Melempus, a rich lord, had owned a house unmatched among the Pylians. Until that day, when King Nellius, noblest in that age, drove him from his native land. And Nellius, for years, turned sequestered Melempus's field and flocks, while he lay bound hand and foot in the keep of Phy Phylicus. Beauty of Nellius's daughter put him there in somber folly and in breaking the in-breaking fury of thrust upon him. But he gave the slip to death and drove the bellowing herd of Iphiclus from Phylike to Pylos, there to claim the bride that ordeal won him from the king. He led her to his brother's house and went on eastward into another land, the bluegrass plain of Argos. Destiny held for him rule over many Argives. Here he married, both great manor house, fathered Antif oh my God, Antiphates and Mantios, commander of both, of whom Antiphates begot o Oikles, and Oikles, the firebrand Ampyros. This champion, the lord of storm cloud Zeus, and strong Apollo loved, nor had he ever to cross the door sill into dim old age. A woman brought by trinkets gave him over to be cut down in the assault on Thebes. Thebes. His sons were Alcmaeon and Ampyros, Philicus. In the meantime, Lord Mentius begot Polyphides, the prophet, and Cleitius, famous name, for dawn and silks of gold carried off Cleitius for his beauty to live among the gods. But Polyphides, high-hearted and exalted by Paolo, above all men for prophecy, withdrew to Hypersia, where his father angered him. He lived on there, foretelling to the world the shape of things to come. His son it was, Theo Theoclimus. Theoclemenus, who came upon Telemachus as he poured out the red wine in the sand near his trim ship with prayer to Athena, and he called out, approaching, Friend well met, here at libation, before going to sea, I pray you by the wind you spend, and by your God, your own life, and your company, enlighten me, and let the truth be known. Who are you, of what city, and what parents? Telemachus turned to him and replied, Stranger, as truly as may be, I'll tell you that I'm from Ithaca, where I was born. My father is, or he once was, Odysseus, but he's a long time gone, and dead, maybe. And that is what I took ship with my friends to find out, for he left long years ago, said Theoclemenus. Cle Theoclemenus, in response, I too have had to leave my home. I killed a cousin. In the wide grazing lands of Argos live many kinsmen of his friends in power, great among the Icians. I fled thee. These I fled, death and vengeance at my back. As death, fate was turned down. I came wandering overland. Give me a plank aboard your ship, I beg, or they will kill me. They are on my track. Telemachus made answer. No two ways about it. Will I pry you from your gunnel when you are desperate to go get to sea? Come aboard, share what we have, and welcome. He took the bronze shod lance from the man's hand and laid it down full length on the deck. It swung his own weight after it aboard the cutter. Then to position aft, making a place for the the Cleminus at near him. The stern lines were slacked off, and Telemachus commanded, Rig the mast, make sail. Nimbly they ran to push the fur pole high and step it firm amidships in the box. Make fast the four stays and hoist aloft the white sail on its halyards. A following wind came down from the gray-eyed Athena. Oh my god, my back. Falling brisk through heaven and so steady the clutter lapped up miles of salt blue sea, passing Kroenini, a beam of Calchas estuary at sundown, the seaways all grew dark. Then by Athena's wind borne on, the ship rounded Phae by night and coasted Elis, the green domain of Ipeg, a fence 
she put her head down toward her head north through toward the running pack of icelets, wondering it if oh, okay, wondering if by sailing wide he sheared off death or would be caught. That night, Odysseus and the swineherd supped again with herdsmen in the mountain hut. At ease when appetite and thirst were turned away, Odysseus, while he talked, observed the swineherd to see if they were hospitable still. And if yet again the men would make him stay under his roof or send him off to town. Listen, he said, you're, you're, I, oh my God, I miss. Listen, lads, at daybreak, I must go and try my luck uh, around the port. I burden you too long. Direct me to put me on the road with someone. Nothing else to put for it but to play the beggar and pomp pompulous parts. I'll get a cup or leaf, maybe from some householder. If I go as far as the great hall of King Odysseus, I might tell Queen Pen Penelope my news. Or I can drift out inside among the suitors to see what alms they give. Rich as they are, if I have whims, I'm deft in the ways of service. That I can say. And you may know for sure, by grace of Hermes, the wayfinder, patron of mortal tasks, the god who honors toil, no man can do a chore better than I can. Set me to build a fire, or chop wood, cock or carve, mix wine, serve, or anything. Inferior men attend to for the gentry. Now you were furious at this, you Maius, and answered, Oh, my swineherd. Friend, friend, how could this fantasy take hold of you? You daily with your life and nothing less. If you feel drawn to mingle in that company, reckless, violent, and famous for it, out to, to the rims of heaven. Slaves they have, but not like you. No, theirs are boys in fresh cloaks and tunics with pomade, ever on their sleek heads and pretty faces. These are their minions, while their tables gleam and groan under big roasts with loaves and wine. Stay with us here. No one is burdened by you, neither myself nor any of my hands. Wait here until Odysseus' son return. You shall not. You shall have clothing from him, cloak and tent, and passage where your heart desires to go. The noble and daring man replied, "May you be dear to Zeus for this, you my yes, even as you are to me. There's spite from pain you give me, and from homelessness. And like, there's nothing worse than knocking about the world. No bitterness, no vagabonds are spared when the cursed belly rages. Well, you master it and me, me, making me wait for the king's son. But now, come tell me, what of Odysseus's mother and his father, whom he took off, took leave off?" Uh, of on the sill of age are they s under the sun's rays still living still or gone down a long ago to lodge with death to this he rugged herdsman answered aye that i can tell you it is brief told laertes lives but daily in his hall he prays for the end of life in soul's delivery heartbroken as he is for a son long gone and for his lady sorrow when she died aged and enfeebled him like a great tree stricken but pining for her own son her brilliant son roar out her life would God no death so sad might come to benefactors dear as she? I loved to always to ask and hear about her while she lived, although she lived in sorrow, for she had brought me up with her own daughter, Princess Kremitim. Ah, Kremini, her youngest child. We were alike in age and nursed e as equals nearly, till in the flower of your, our years they gave her, married her to a Simon, Simon prince, taking his many gifts. For my own portion, her mother gave me new clothing, cloak and sandals, and sent me to the woodland. Well, she loved me. Ah, how I miss that family. It is true the blissful gods prosper my work. I have meat and drink to spare for those I prize. But so removed I am. I have no speech. Oh my god, how much longer? Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Ah. Oof, oof, oof. I have no speech with my sweet mistress. Now that evil days and overbearing men darken her house, tenants all hanker for good talk and gossip around with her lair lady, and a snack and haul, a cup or two before they take the road to their home acres, each one bearing home some gift to cheer his heart. The great taxation answered, You were still a child, I see, when exiled somehow from your parents' land. Tell me, had it been sacked in war, the city of spacious ways in which they made their home, your father and your gentle mother, or were you kidnapped alone, brought here by sea, huddled with the sheep and some foul pirate squadron? to this landowner's hall. He paid your ransom? The master of the woodland answered. Friend, now that you show an interest in that matter, attend me quietly, be at your ease, and drink your wine. These autumn nights are long, ample for storytelling and for sleep. You need not to go to bed before the hour, sleeping from dusk to dawn, a dull affair. affair. Let any other here to, who wishes, though, retire to, to rest. At daybreak, let him breakfast, and Take the king's own swine into the wilderness. Here's a tight rope. We sh we'll drink on it, you and I, and our ease our hearts in of hardships we remember. Sharing old times, in later days, a man can find a charm in old adversity. 
<sighs> Exile and pain. As to your question now, a certain island, Syri, oh my god, Syri by name, you may have heard the name, lies off over Tegia, due west, and holds the sunsets of the year. Not very populous, but good for grazing, sheep and kind, rich too in wine and grain. No dearth is, dearth is ev ever known there. No disease wars on the folk of ills that plague mankind. But when the townsmen reach old age, Apollo with his long bow of silver comes, and Artemis showering arrows of mild death. Two towns divide the farmlands that hold domain, and both were ruled by Cateus, my father, or Minion's heir, and a great godlike man. Now one day, one of those renowned seafaring men, sea dogs, Phoenicians, came ashore with bags of gods for trading. Father Anne had in her household a woman of Phoenicia, a handsome one, a highly skilled. Well, she gave in to the seductions of those rovers. One of them found her washing near the mooring and lay with her, making such love to her as women in their frailty are confused by, even the best of them. In due course, then, he asked her who she was and where she hailed from, and nodding toward my father's roof, she said, I am Sidon Town, Smithy of Bronze, all for all east. Arubus Pasha's daughter, Typhian pirates caught me in byway and sold me into slavery overseas in this man's home. He could afford my ransom. <sighs> the sailor who had lain with her replied, Why not ship out with us on the home run homeward and see your father's high roof tail ag hall again? Your father and your mother, still in Sidon and so rich they are said to be. It could be done that if your sailors take oath, I sh I'll be given passage home unharmed. Well, soon she had them sw swearing at all pets as she desired, repeating every syllable, whereupon she warned them. Not a single word about her meeting here. Never call out to me when any of you see me in the lane or at the well. Some visitor might bear tales to ho the old man. If he guessed the truth, I'll be chained up. Your lives will be in peril. No, keep it secret. Hurry with your peddling. And when your hold is filled with livestock, send a message to me at Manor Hall. Good. Gold I'll, I'll bring, whatever it comes to hand, and something else, too, as my passage fee. The master's child, my charge, a boy so high, bright for his age. He runs with me on errands, and I take him to with me happily. His prince would... Be I know not one in sail broad, broad. Her bargain made, and she went back to the manor. But they were on the island all that year, getting by trade a cargo of her cattle, until the ship at length being laid in full, ready for sea, they sent a messenger to the Phoenician's woman. Shrewd it he was, this fellow who came around my father's hall, showing gold golden chain all strong with amber and a necklace. Maids in waiting, and my mother passed it down from hand to hand, admiring it, engaging that they would buy it. But that Dodrum, as soon as he had caught the woman's eye, nodded. Uh, slipped away to join the ship. She took my hand and led me through the court into the portico. The portico. There, by luck, she found wine cups and tables still in place. Her father's attendant counselors had dined just now before they went to the assembly. Quickly, she had three goblets in her belly and dress to carry with her while she, I tagged along in my bewilderness. Bewilderment. The sun went down, and all the lanes grew dark as we descended, skirting the harbor in our haste to where the to where those traders of Phoenicia held the ship. All went aboard at once to input the scene, taking the two of us. A favoring wind blew from the powers of heaven. We sailed on six nights and days without event. Then Zeus, the son of Kronos, added one more noon, and soon arrows from Artemis pierced the woman's hearts. Stone dead she dropped into the slashing bilge that the way a turn plummets, and the sailors heaved her over as tender pickings for the seals and fish. Now I was left in dread, alone, while wind and currents bore them on to Ithaca. Laertes purchased me. That was the way I first laid eyes upon this land. Odysseus, the kingly man, replied, you, rose, you rouse my pity, telling that what you, you endured when you were young. But surely Zeus had good put, uh, had put good along... Mm -hmm. Zeus, <coughs> Zeus put it good alongside ill. Torn from your own far home, you had luck to come into a kind, kind man's service, generous with food and drink, and a good life you led, unlike my own, all spent in barren Roman from one country to the next, till now. So the two men talked on into the night, leaving few hours for sleep before the dawn stepped it up to her bright chair. <sighs> Under the island Lee, uh, the ship now dripping under the island Lee, Telemachus' companions. Wait, did I skip one? No, okay. 
The ship's now drifting under the island lead. Telemachus is commanding and sail and mast. Sun shipped the oars and rowed ashore. They moored her stern by the stout hawser's lines, tossed out the bowstone, and waited in beyond the wash of ripples to mix their wine and cook their morning meal. When they had turned back hunger and thirst, Telemachus arose, uh, 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 arose to give the order of the day. Pull for the town, he said, and berth her ship while I go inland across the country. Later this evening, after looking at my farms, I'll join you in the city. When the day Day comes, I hope to celebrate our crossing, feasting everyone on good red meat and wine. His noble passenger, the Theo Clemen okay. Thea Clemenus, now asked, What as to me, my dear young fellow, where shall I go? Will I find lodging here with some one of the lords of Stony Ithaca, or go straight to your mother's hall and yours? Telemachus turned round to him and said, I should myself invite you to our hall if things were otherwise. There'd be no lack of entertainment for you. As it stands, no place could be more wretched for a guest while I'm away. Mother will never see you. She almost never shows herself at homes to the suitors. Are there, but stays in her chamber, weaving at, upon her loom. No, let me name another man for you to go visit. Yuring Malachi, uh, uh, Yuring the honored son of Pil Pil Polybus. In Ithaca, they are dazzled by him now, the strongest of the princes, bent on making mother and all Odysseus' wealth his own. Zeus on Olympus, he only knows if some dark hour for them will intervene. Birds were barely spoken when a hawk Apollo's courier up on the right, clutching a dove on plucking her. So feathers floated down on to the ground between Telemachus and Lord Cutter. The the Clemenus calling him called him apart and gripped his hand, whispering, I got spoken this bird signed on the right. I knew it's when I saw the hawk fly over us. There is a kinglier outside house than yours, Telemachus. Here in the realm of Ithaca, your family will be in power forever. The young prince, clear and spirit, answered, Be it so, friend, as you say, and you may and may you know as well the friendship of my house and many gifts from me, so everyone may call you fortunate. He called a thrusted crewman and a trusted crewman named Perseus and said to him, Perius, son of Clytius, can I rely on you again as ever? Most of all the friends who sailed with me to Pylos, take this man home with you to take care of him, treat him with honor till I come. To this, Pyrrhus, the good spearman, answered, I stay in the wild country while you will. I shall be looking after him, Telemachus. He will not lack good lodging. <sighs> Down to the ship he turned and boarded her and called the others to cast off the stern lines and come aboard. So men climbed in to sit beside the rowlocks. Telemachus, um, Telemachus now tied his sandals on the, the, and lifted his tough spear from the ship's deck. Hawsers were taken in, and they shoved off to reach the town by way of the open sea. As he commanded them, Royal Odysseus' own dear son, Telemachus, on foot and swiftly, he went up toward the stockade where swine were penned in hundreds. And at night, the guardian of the swine, the foresters, slept under arms on duty for his masters. Oh, my God. Still took 30 minutes. <sighs> Oh. oh my god, I'm lightheaded. That's not good. Oh my god. Oh jeez. Uh so Athena, she goes to tell Marcus again, and whoever Nestor's son was, it was Pisistratus. Pisis Pisistros, and um, uh, oh come on, give my legs. Okay, uh, she she tells Telemachus to hurry home because all of the the suitors are there, and they're like, ah, they're gonna. They say you're 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 whatever the suitor is, Yuri Malokos, Yuri Yuri Lokos. Uh, he's gonna marry Penelope, and that's not good, and so. Uh, Telemachus, he says to Menelaus, he's like, hey, um, uh, can we go home? And Menelaus is like, yeah, okay, well, you can go home, but first let us prepare some gifts, and then they prepare some gifts, um, and then, uh, some, some sign from the gods, I forgot what it was, I think it was like a, like a bird, like from before, like a bird comes in, and it's like, and then Helen's like, oh my god, Odysseus came back. And he's in Ithaca. And Telemachus is like, yeah. Woo. Woo. What happened next? Um. Oh, yeah. So, um, 
Pisistratus uh, says that um, they should visit Nestor because Nestor gives them gifts, and he'd be like, "Ah, oh, I didn't. He didn't come home, and I couldn't give him gifts on his departure, because like Nestor's like a big old man. He likes giving gifts." Um. So, uh, then they're they're at an island. I think they're at Nestor's island. Yeah, I think they're at Nestor's island, and then they meet this guy, which starts with a th. I forgot the guy's name. Uh. Theo, let's just call him Theo. Theo is, um, he's a criminal. Um, um, I don't exactly remember what Theo did other than that he was a criminal. Yeah, that's, that's that. Um, um, uh, what happened next? Uh, uh, hmm. oh, okay, I remember. So, um, Odysseus, he's coming in. No, he's not coming in. He's he's in the hut. With your you you my my you my less you guy that guy the shepherd the 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 uh, swine herder and um what happened oh he's like ah oh, I should get going I should probably leave now and then the guy's like oh no you shouldn't leave you should stay longer ah. Uh. But, um, but then Odysseus is like, oh, but, like, I gotta, gotta get it, gotta get going. And then you, you, Malos, you, Magus, is like, ah, oh, but you could work for the suitors, like, you're Locos, you're Malokos, you're, you're Shlokos, you know? Um... Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. It was Odysseus saying to you, the Maeus, Ma Eumaeus, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and Odysseus was saying to Eumaeus, uh, you can earn your keep by working for the suitors. Um, but no, that's not what they disagree on that. Um, and you, Eumaeus is like, no, no, it's not good. And um, then they tell stories. They tell some stories. I don't know who told stories, and I don't remember what they were about. Um, oh, there was something about pirates. So there was like a girl. Oh yeah, Eumaeus. He was like, there was like a girl he fell in love with, and then like afterward he asked about her, and she said she was like from pirates lands. And then, um, and then the pirates, he went with the girl, and then the pirates took him to Ithaca, to Odysseus, and then, um, they, they, like, trapped him, I mean, you know, stuff like that, and then, I don't remember, did, did the other one tell the story? I don't remember. Um, and then Telemachus uh, arrives in Ithaca, and something, 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 and then an end. Like he's talking to someone at the end. I have no clue who who he's talking to. Pyraeus. So that's a trusted crew member. I don't know. Something happened at the end. Telemachus arrives in Ithaca. That's the important part. God dang it. Oh, God, that was a boring chapter. I, this is a boring.